know every one of y'all want to sing like Darian, don't you? <laughs> yeah, me too. But I'll be honest with you, God wants to hear you sing. Um, might not be as pretty as when Darian sings, but he wants to hear you sing. Let's pray. Father, I humbly ask that your Holy Spirit would help us understand what you want to teach us through the scripture today. And I pray that in the name of Christ. Amen. Next weekend, uh, our guest speaker is Bob Goff. He was here about two years ago. And um, it was the weekend that we invited one of our neighbors to come to church. And if you remember from a couple of years ago, if you were here, Bob Goff is this tall, retired lawyer who does not come across as a lawyer. He's crazy. I mean, he just has all this energy. Remember him? Well, in the middle of so many of the stories that Bob Goff was telling about what God is using him for and to do, one of the stories was about that after a lot of time that Mr. Goff had spent in Uganda, he had come to understand that these witch doctors had been sacrificing children in the name of their religion. Well, Bob Goff, as a Christ follower, knew that couldn't be. So he had to do something. So as a lawyer, long story short, he tells a long, great story. The short version is Mr. Goff was the first lawyer to try and win a persecuted case of a witch doctor who was sacrificing children. And the first witch doctor, his name was Kabi. He was sentenced to prison. Mr. Goff's back in the U.S., but it was on his heart to go back, so he went back and he asked permission of the prison to be able to speak with that witch doctor, which he did. And Bob tells the story of him sharing Christ with Kabi. And over time, Kabi surrendered his life to Jesus. And then it said, then he went on to say that sometime later, Standing side by side in the prison yard with 3,000 inmates, Mr. Goff and Kabi preached the gospel of Christ together, and that over time, many of those inmates came to Christ. Well, the weekend came on. It was Sunday afternoon. Laurie and I were in the driveway, and our friend came by, and she was very complimentary of the church. I said, love, thanks for inviting me to the church. By the way, I couldn't believe it was a renovated grocery store. That was kind of cute for a renovated grocery store. She talked a lot about you. So that's a that's joyful people. It's one of the reasons I've told you I love you. You're so easy to love. You made an impact on her. But then my neighbor said this. But that story that that man told about the witch doctor named Kabi being forgiven, I don't buy that. That's not fair. Now, my neighbor's not a Christ follower. Um, She's as sweet as she can be. She'd make a wonderful Christ follower. She just not surrendered to Jesus yet, and she doesn't really know what to make of all this church stuff that we do. But... I know what she's saying. You do too, don't you? Just doesn't seem right or fair that a person who had committed such horrific sin would be forgiven. Well, there's another man who understands that as well. He's a prophet. His name's Jonah. Um, You know the story of Jonah's four chapters, and rather than us walking through the four chapters, let me give you this general overview. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and to preach against their wickedness. Nineveh would be Jonah's enemy. Um, The wickedness would be described in great detail in just a couple of minutes. But Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh to preach against their wickedness because they were such horrible people. So he ran the opposite direction. So Jonah, he he lived here in Israel. So if I'm standing in Israel, uh, to my northeast here is Assyria, and at the northern part of Assyria is Nineveh, is the capital. But I'm here in Israel. Actually, Jonah was born in uh, a little town close to Nazareth, so close to where Jesus had grown up. And on the coastline down here uh, was Joppa, and it was a port city, and you could get on a boat, and there's the Mediterranean Sea, about 600 miles. And at the other end of the Mediterranean Sea is Tarshish. And as the story goes, Jonah went to get in the boat, and he was going to sail away to Tarshish. So rather than going this way, Jonah went this way. Gets in the boat, there's a bunch of other sailors there, and the sailors and Jonah encounter this incredible storm, which was not that common in their day. 
So the superstitious sailors were asking one another, which one of you has done something horrifically wrong that would cause this great storm? So it says they were praying out to any God that they knew, and they look at Jonah, and they say, what did you do? So their superstition in that day was they would cast lots, and when they casted lots, it fell to Jonah. So they looked at him and said, who are you and what have you done? Well, Jonah's reply was, well, I'm a Hebrew. I believe in God, and actually, I worship the God who actually made this sea, but I don't like what God has asked me to do, so I'm running away. Well, Jonah and all the sailors were terrified. They all thought they were going to die, so Jonah offered himself to be thrown overboard. That way, he wouldn't have to go preach to the people he didn't like in the first place. So it says in the book of Jonah that the sailors turned to Jonah's God and said, don't blame us for what we're about to do, but we're going to throw Jonah overboard. And they did, and when Jonah went in, the storm stopped. So it worked. Sailors turned to God. But Jonah was swallowed by a fish, and you know that he stayed there for three days. And for three days and three nights, Jonah did a lot of praying, I guess. And he did some confessing, and he eventually was vomited out, it says. Now, my mother would not like for me to use the word vomit in a sermon, but it's in Jonah chapter 2, and also it's in the Bible, and my mom's in heaven, so I think we're good. <laughs> then for a second time, God told Jonah, I told Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach. And this time, Jonah obeyed, and it was the shortest sermon ever. It was eight English words. It'd be about five Hebrew words, and this is how the sermon went. Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. And then in Jonah chapter 3, it says that the people of Nineveh believed God. Even the king of Nineveh issued a decree that everybody should turn from their wicked ways and turn to Jonah's God and pray that he would show them compassion. God showed them compassion, and he did not destroy them. But Jonah was mad at God because he showed mercy to the horrible people of Nineveh. So in summary... The book of Jonah is this. Jonah ran from God, then Jonah obeyed God. Wicked people turned to God, but Jonah was mad at God. Why? Jonah just really struggled that God would show compassion to people who've done horrific things. My neighbor understood that. I understand that. You understand that. So did Jonah. So what I'd love to do is ask three questions and then make three observations. Question number one. So who really were these people of Nineveh? Okay, well, Assyria, this nation to the northeast of Israel, they would be considered Israel's greatest enemy. Um, they were known for incredible wickedness. They would conquer, you know, neighboring countries, and when they did, they would torture people before killing them. They would take their possessions. They would even take some of the people and use them as slaves. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, so you could say that Nineveh was the capital of wickedness. 120,000 people lived in Nineveh, so 120,000 wicked people. Today, I suppose we could compare Nineveh to Nazi Germany under Hitler in the 30s and 40s. Maybe we could compare Nineveh to the terrorists who attacked us at 9-11. Just the emotion that it stirs up when any of us say 9-11. Well, that's the emotion that is stirred up in Jonah when God said, go to Nineveh. They were his enemy. Question number two, so who was Jonah? Well, Jonah would be like above the pay grade of a campus pastor. Okay, he was a godly man, but he was a man God chose to speak through. And so he was obviously a really good man, and most people would consider Jonah actually the hero of the story because even though he originally disobeyed God, once he found himself in the belly of the whale and he called out to God, he was spit out and he eventually did obey God. By the way, let's be clear, in Jonah chapter 2, when he was in the belly for three days and he was praying, nowhere in there did he ever say to God, I'm sorry. He just cried out to him, just cried out to him. But then Jonah, once vomited out, he did obey God. 
and he went to his enemy, and he preached, and they all turned to God, the end. It was just like a Billy Graham crusade, except really short, where everybody came to God. But Jonah's not the hero. Jonah hated what God did. God loved Jonah's enemy, and Jonah simply struggled with that because it just wasn't fair. Jonah chapter 4, it says, But to Jonah this seemed very wrong. He became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Here is what Jonah said to him. Lord, isn't this exactly what I thought would happen when I was still at home? That is what I tried to prevent by running away to Tarshish. I knew that you were gracious. You were tender and kind. You are slow to get angry. You are full of love. You are a God who takes pity on people. You don't want to destroy them. Lord, take away my life. I'd rather die. So who is Jonah? I would say he was a man of God who would rather die than for horrific people to come to know God. Question number three. So who's God? Well, I could spend the rest of my life, and I would be inadequate to describe the fullness of who God is and his character. But in this story in Jonah, we know at least three things about God. First is God will punish sin. I mean, that's why he told Jonah to go to Nineveh in the first place. Go preach against their wickedness because God will punish wickedness. He will punish sin. But number two, God will also show mercy and compassion to people who will turn to him. And number three from this story, God wants me, you, to tell people, even our enemies, about God's compassion and mercy. So let me make three observations. First observation, you're not going to like this one. We often think it's unfair that God would forgive people who have done horrible things. I know that's what you think. Me too. We just think it's unfair. I think that's what my neighbor was struggling with, that God would forgive Cobby, the witch doctor. She said, I don't buy that. I'm going to make a distinction here that There's a difference between people that we don't like because they've done horrific things and we think they don't deserve the mercy of God and those people we would actually consider our enemies. This group of people are just sinners. This group of people are enemies. They would want to kill us. They might be the group of people that we would want to kill. So there's a difference between the two, but in Nineveh, they were both. People who had done horrific things and some of them who would want to kill Jonah himself. In the category of people who have done horrific things, about whom you and I think they don't deserve the mercy of God, I knew a preacher in the hometown where I grew up, and he knew of a lady who had an impure reputation. Children in the room, you know what I'm saying. But this preacher wanted her to know of the grace of Jesus. So he would go to her home to communicate the grace of Jesus. But there were people in his church that were very critical, not to him, but to one another, that he would go and talk to such a lady. Now, they could take the high road and say, well, it's simply because we don't want him to be accused of being with a woman with an impure reputation. But that was not their motive. Their motive was they didn't think she deserved his mercy. One of my high school teachers, he was a Christian man, but he didn't like one of the parables that Jesus taught, as if you can choose which ones you like and don't like. It's the parable of the landowner. Do you remember it? He needed a bunch of workers to work in his field, and so he went out at the beginning of the day, and he saw a bunch of men. He said, hey, you're not working. Would you like to work in my field? They said, yes. He said, wonderful. I'll give you a day's wage. Well, the story goes on that the landowner was walking in the town. He saw some other men who weren't working. This was about three hours later. He said, would you like to go work in my field? They said, yes. Three hours later, found some more men. At the end of the day, with only one hour left in the work day, He saw another group of men. He said, why are you not working? Would you like to go work in my field? And they said, yes. So they went and worked for an hour. 
At sundown, when the day was over, it was time to pay. The landowner called his CFO, and he said, hey, pay all the guys. But I want you to pay them all the same wage. But you know how the story goes. The men who had worked all day, probably a 12-hour day, came to the owner and said, that's not fair. We worked all day, and those guys especially only worked one hour, and you're paying them the same. And he said, didn't I tell you I'd pay you a full day's wage? And I did. But what was their problem? Their problem was it just wasn't fair. And the landowner said to them, don't I have the right to do as I want with my money? Are you envious because I am generous? Would we be envious that God would want to share his mercy with people that we think have not earned it? Well, my high school teacher just simply said of that parable, I don't agree with it, as if he has done something to earn being in the kingdom. Observation number two. God wants everyone to know of his mercy and compassion and forgiveness, even our enemies. Now, the people of Nineveh, Nineveh were for sure Israel's enemy. They wanted to kill them. The Ninevites would have killed Jonah. They were clearly his enemy. But according to this story in the book of Jonah, God loved the Ninevites as well. Jonah chapter 1, verse 2, it says, God said to Jonah, preach against their wickedness. But in Jonah chapter 4, the last verse, it says that God was concerned about the people. So it seems clear to me he hated their wickedness, but he didn't hate them. He despised what they were doing, but he loved them. And he wanted Jonah to go tell them the difference. I have a friend. Uh, his name is Steve, Steve Saint. He's about 10, year, 10 years older than I am. And in 1956, there were five men trying to communicate the gospel to a tribe of people in Ecuador. But all five of these missionaries were speared to death by the natives there in Ecuador. One of these men was the name Nate Saint. Nate was speared to death by a native. That native's name was Menkai. Steve Saint was Nate Saint's son. Steve was a little boy there in Ecuador when his father was speared to death by Menkai. To sit with Steve over a cup of coffee and to hear him tell the story that I'm about to tell you is so humbling to me. Over time, the commitment to Christ that Steve has compelled him to stay focused on those people in Ecuador. And over time, he got to the tribe of people, the very tribe of people that had murdered his father. And he went there to tell them of their wickedness. But he told them, God hates your ways, but he loves you. And they communicated the gospel of Jesus. And many in this tribe accepted Jesus as the Lord of their life. And one of those men was Menkai. Steve's there in the center, the one that doesn't look like a native. <laughs> the one on your far right, that's Menkai. So there was a day that Steve was standing face to face with the man who had murdered his dad. And that man had now put his faith in Jesus. Now what was Steve saint to do? He put his arm around him. And he accepted him because God had. And Steve now calls Menkai, I cannot fathom this. He refers to him as his adoptive father. What do you do with that story? Well, there was a man named Saul. He was murdering Christians. And Jesus himself stopped Saul in his tracks. He actually called out to him, why are you persecuting me? In a manner of speaking, he said, why are you murdering my people? And you know the story. God hated Saul. I mean, God hated what Saul was doing, but he didn't hate Saul 
God literally changed him. He turned Saul into Paul, and Paul is who wrote so much of our New Testament. The man who used to be Saul, who became Paul, wrote these words in Romans chapter 5. For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. Jesus hated my sin, but he loves me. I used to be an enemy of God, but through the mercy of Jesus, I have now been made a friend. I have been reconciled to the Father because of what Jesus has done. Observation number three. God wants us to tell our enemies about him. I'll be honest with you, I really don't want to do that. I'm not kidding. And neither do you. Neither did Jonah. But God asks us to tell them about him. Tell them what? What are you to tell your enemy? Well, at the very least, we're to tell them that we love them and we're praying for them. That's exactly what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. You heard it said, love your neighbor but hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Why? Because while God would hate their sinfulness, he loves them and wants them to know him. But somebody has to go tell them that he loves them, and about the best way to do that is I need to love them first. I'll be honest with you. What I'm saying to you, I find really hard to do, but it's what I'm asked to do. Let me ask you what your attitude is towards men and women sitting in this room right now who used to have the title inmate. What's your attitude toward people who live on the street Downtown Louisville, downtown LaGrange. If we had a downtown at Crestwood, what would your attitude be toward street people? What's your attitude toward people who you know attend AA meetings or you've seen walking out of a rehab center? What is your attitude toward people, young ladies, who have found themselves in an unwed pregnancy and they're going into a pregnancy resource center? What's our attitude toward people that we see who are just covered with tattoos? What's your attitude toward people who sit across the political aisle from you? What's our attitude toward people who caused Pearl Harbor? What's our attitude toward people who caused the horrific devastation known as 9-11? What's our attitude toward people who used at one time to own slaves? Jesus is called a friend of sinners in Matthew chapter 7. And in Mark 2, Jesus himself said, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. I find myself in a dangerous category, and maybe you fit it as well that sometimes my mindset thinks that now that I'm in the kingdom of God, I want to look down on those outside the kingdom of God as if I did something to deserve the kingdom of God in the first place. Let me say it again. I find myself sometimes in the mindset that now that I'm in the kingdom of God, I look down on those who are not yet in the kingdom of God as if I did something to deserve the kingdom of God in the first place. Jonah didn't think that the people of Nineveh deserved God. That's what he said. God didn't want to go in the first place because I knew you were going to show mercy and compassion. That's what he knew, but he didn't want the Ninevites to know. So he ran. Listen to the similarity in these two scriptures. Jonah chapter 4, verse 11, God said, And shouldn't I show concern for the great city of Nineveh? It is more than 120,000 people. They can't tell right from wrong. 
800 years later, while nailed to a cross, from the lips of Jesus, he said, Father, forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. You have a little card that was given you when you came in. Uh, looks like a little business card. If you didn't get one, um, we only have about three million of them in the atrium. On the way out, you can get one by the door. It says, pray for one on one side and on the other has a name. That little line for you to write a name is to be the name of a person for you to pray for, a specific person for you to pray for. But here's the category. It would be the name of a person that I don't think deserves to hear about the mercy of God. It would be the name of a person that I would actually view as my enemy. That's going to be really hard for me. And chances are, for some of you, you're going to find it really, really hard to do this as well. But in Nineveh, there's 120,000 people. They were not nameless and they were not faceless. To Jonah, they might have been, but not to God. He knew their name. He knew them. So who is your Nineveh? Who is your Kabi? Who is your Menkai? Who's the person that you don't think deserves God or is actually such an enemy that surely God will never show them any grace and mercy? And write that person's name on here. I'd encourage you to take the whole week and pray about it. Don't just do this in the next couple of minutes because this is something that's going to be really challenging. It really is for me. There's a retired school teacher who attends the 9 o'clock service here at the Crestwood campus. She sits right there. And for the past about 20 years, she's been sending a letter to one of her elementary students that she had years ago. That elementary student has found himself in prison for the last many, many years. But rather than just writing him off and saying he's gotten what he deserves, and punishment for his crime is fitting, but she wants him to know of the compassion and the mercy of God. So Miss Jan keeps writing him letters all the time. Whether she gets a response or not, she keeps writing him letters. See, the heart of the matter is, and I have to say this because it's on our bulletin, said so the heart of the matter is the title of the sermon. The heart of the matter is God loves all people, even our enemies. And God asks us to love and pray for our enemies. And the thing is, a lot of you don't like me right now because of what I've just said. I don't like me very much either. But I didn't say it. Jesus did. And what if our prayers will help the next Saul become Paul? What if our prayers God will use to help the next Steve Saint forgive a Menkai? What if God uses our prayer and answers it and the next Kabi accepts Christ? What if our enemy actually becomes our brother in Christ? What if she becomes our sister in Christ? And together we go tell other people, about how God can forgive enemies and then they become brothers and sisters in Christ. What if? What if? Well, I'm going to be honest with you right here. In my flesh, I do not have what it takes to do this. Ever since I was little and read the words of Jesus, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Even when I was little, I knew when I was going to get old, I wasn't going to like it. And now that I'm old, I don't like it. And neither do you. Neither did my neighbor. Neither did Jonah. So what do you do with it? You ask for help. I don't really know what to make of this, but I have a hunch that there's a connection between Matthew 12 and this story of Jonah. In Matthew 12, Jesus refers to Jonah. It's one of the few times he refers to a prophet. And he says, just as Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days and three nights. So the Son of Man's going to be in the belly of the earth, but then he'll be raised again. He was using a prophetic metaphor, which we understand. But I wonder if, just as kind of Jonah kind of went down into the water, but God gave him mercy when, God, when Jonah cried out, and Jonah was kind of, so to speak, reborn out of this watery grave, what if we come to God and we say, Father, 
from the day that I was baptized into you and you gave me this rebirth and I was, as he told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. In my flesh, I don't have what it takes. Would you help me to trust your spirit and depend on your spirit in my heart and my mind to pray for those people that I just can't stand, especially those who have done horrific things and I consider my enemy? What if that's our spiritual nature reaching out to God and saying help? By the way, Scripture is very clear. Our fight, our enemy, is not flesh and blood. It is our spiritual adversary, Satan. So there is no man on this planet that is beyond the reach of God's mercy, God himself, that no one should perish. But since sin will not go unpunished, then you and I are compelled to go let them know of the mercy of God so that they can relent of their sin and come to God. Yes? Let's pray. Father, you know all week long I really struggled with Jonah, still do, just like my neighbor, just like my church family sitting in front of me right now. So, Father, we just humbly say, wow, we are so fleshly and we are so spiteful and we think we deserve. And I read from Paul that I used to be an enemy, but in Christ you showed me mercy. So, Father, I pray for the spiritual fervor of this church family that we would love you so much that we would want people that are far from you to know about you. Would you give us that? Would your Holy Spirit in us drive us to communicate Jesus to our enemies? And that's what we pray for their sake and for your glory. In the name of Christ, amen.